anyone has joined. Um, tonight, an interesting guest, uh, an old friend and, and someone who I've had acquaintance with for a lot of years, Bob Linquist, formerly of Coupe and now Linquist Wines and, and Verdad. And we're going to taste the Verdad Albarino and the Linquist uh, Grenache. But uh, my history with Bob is, uh, or at least Bob's family is long. When I first moved to California from England in 1984, I worked at a restaurant called the Paradise Cafe. And Bob's wines were somewhat of the house wine. I believe he made the wine. It was Paradise Cafe Chardonnay is what I remember. But also his sister, Sarah, started at the restaurant the same week as I did. So Sarah and I had a lot of fun roasting around Santa Barbara together. And then I got to meet Bob. And then I got into the wine industry and realized what a what a huge person he is within this business. And and of course, everyone know, that knows Bob knows he's the, the nicest man in our industry, which there's not a lot of really, really nice people in this business, but Bob is the one. So known about him for a long time. Of course, that was Chardonnay. He's better known for the coupe, Marsans and Roussans and Syrahs and being one of the very, very first of the, the Rhone Rangers, if you will, pioneering Rhone varieties in, in California. And a lot of stuff, water's gone under that bridge. Uh, his son, Ethan, we were just talking about him. He got into the business too. And Bob has, has made a lot of really iconic wines for me. Uh, always been a huge fan of the Marsans and the Roussan and, and Syrah. Roussan, particularly a favorite of mine that he's he's made. But also, he likes to show old, uh, old Marsans, which is... It first was an intrigue to me, and now it's a pleasure for me. I really understand it more, and I've learned a lot about that writing from him. So we're going to just talk with uh, with Bob and see where it goes. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit of the past, but I'm a bit more interested in where he is now and what he's done and the vineyards, et cetera. So I think without further ado, we'll bring Bob in and see where we end up. Let's, we'll try not to talk about the Dodgers, though, because I know nothing about baseball. <laughs> you mean the best team in baseball? Yeah, so I've heard. Fortunately, at there's not. During, at least during the regular season, they're the best team. At least, at least in your mind, uh, perhaps. <laughs> like in every good sports team. That's right. So, hey, Bob, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Thanks, Neil. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's a, you know, it's always a pleasure. We we always get to speak in very crowded rooms trying to talk to each other while we're trying to sell our wines and, and introduce people to our products. So it's nice to have a one-on-one -on -one for sure. And I mean, I think to begin with, we need to look a little bit at your, at your history and, and when you started. And like I said, my first encounter with, with you was, was Paradise Cafe. I think it was Chardonnay. It wasn't even a Rhone. And that was in the 1984, Four, that would have been yeah. and as far as I know it was just Chardonnay maybe you did a Pinot too I don't know but it was a long time ago later, yeah later I did a house Syrah for them and, and actually I turned over the house Chardonnay business to Jim Clendenin uh, after, okay I, I made the Paradise Chardonnay for about 10 years and then uh, it just made more sense for me to make the Syrah and for Jim to make the Chardonnay there was a year when we were short on Chardonnay and so I said to Jim hey why don't you take this program over and so he did and he he still, to this day, makes Paradise Chardonnay, and I still make Paradise Syrah. Really? Yeah. Although under the new, you know, Paradise is under new ownership. Yeah, they, so, so they're kind yeah. of running, they're kind of running through the inventory that we had for them, and whether or not it will continue uh, remains to be seen. That was a that restaurant was a long run. My sister opened that place in '83, and it went until what two years ago under at least one one of the same owners. Yeah, Randy Rouse. Yeah, they he just yeah. sold it. Uh, where are we now? We're all, it was earlier this year when he sold it to the same group that that owns the Lark and Le Marchand and yeah, yeah. I forget what that what the name of that group is, but uh, Sherry Villanueva is kind of the, uh, the person behind that. Uh, I think it, it might be called something as innocuous as Acme, <laughs> Acme right. Company or something like that. Uh, I'm going to go on a limb and say it was it was time for a, a freshen up for the Paradise Cafe after whatever that is, 35 years or something, right? 
I was thinking about it on the way home from work today and your sister, Sarah, was responsible for me completely forgetting and blowing off my second date with the lovely lady who's now my wife. <laughs> I was hanging out with Sarah at her house and completely forgot I had the second date. It was, I was not popular. Ah, oh, well, you know, I'm glad, it survived. I'm glad it survived that bump in the road. <laughs> she married me anyway. Yeah. So, but at that time you're doing coupe, right? And it wasn't really about Chardonnay. Was it about Rhone's right from the beginning? Yeah, I started Coupe in 1982 with Chardonnay and, and Syrah, and then I also made a little bit of a dry rosé wine that we called Van Gris, uh, which, which turned out to be kind of ahead of its time. I wasn't the only one doing a wine like that. Richard Sanford was already making a Van Gris, but the kind of the rosé, the, the, the dry rosé style, you know, hadn't really caught on yet. <laughs> well, that was, um, we made our first dry rosé at Tablas Creek in 1999 and it still hadn't it was still ahead of its time so right. you were a solid 30 years ahead of your game there yeah these things evolve you know people's tastes evolve and they finally finally catch on to you know something that uh, the Europeans have known about for a long time I wonder if it's like for me I wonder if it's just people eventually go to Europe and drink rosé the entire vacation and come back and realize that that's a good thing you know? that, that, that is certainly part of it that's for it sure. certainly am to me. So Coupe starting there and then Roussan, which was really is one of my favorite of the wines you've made. When did that come in? Yeah, that came in actually quite a bit later. And, and that ties into to, uh, Tablas Creek. Um, we planted in 1997 uh, five acres of Roussan here at Bienacito Vineyard, which is where the winery is located, which is where I'm sitting right now. I'm sitting in my office at the winery. And uh, we planted five acres of um, Roussan, and we wanted to get budwood from Tablas Creek because you guys had just brought it in fairly recently. Mm -hmm. We knew it would be the real deal, and it was certified, et cetera, et cetera. Which the Miller family, who owns Bien the Cito, they like to, you know, they like to plant certified budwood. So that's how that started. Uh, and wow. it's planted, yeah, planted on a uh, west-facing hillside slope just opposite the winery that I always kind of admired and I kind of looked at that spot and thought it would be a great place to plant some grapes and eventually we did plant uh, Roussan there and, and uh, yeah made all those lovely wines over, over the you, last 20 years from there. Do you continue to make Roussan from that block? I, I, I don't at the moment when when Coupe was sold in 2018 uh, the new owners of Coupe also took over the grape contract and mm. it's such a small block that there was no extra Roussan. You know, it's a, it's a low yielding variety and a small block. And so they took over the grape contract and they're giving up that contract. At least I've been told. Um, I probably, maybe I shouldn't be talking about this on air, but. <laughs> but yeah, Lone Throne might just swoop in there and. <laughs> apparently giving up that contract after this vintage. So next year I'll be able to get Roussan from that same block again for, for my, my new Lindquist label. Well, if you don't need it all, give me a call because I'd love to make some Roussan from that block. <laughs> yeah, no, and so, Coupe, you started in 82 and and you became famous as the Rhone, one of the Rhone Rangers guys with Randall and Steve Edmonds and um, Easton. And when did you sell Coupe? Uh, in 2018. So just, just uh, a little less than two years ago. Well, not long ago. Yeah, November, but, November 1st of 2018. I, I had partnered with, uh, in 2013, I had partnered with a, a guy named Charles Banks who had a company, uh, a, like a portfolio of wineries and a marketing, sales and marketing company. And I had been looking for a long-term financial partner because coming out of the recession, uh, I didn't really have deep enough pockets to kind of survive that that hit. And uh, uh, so I've been looking for a long-term financial partner, found this guy, Charles Banks, who seemed like the ideal partner at the time. And uh, it was a relationship that unfortunately went south, not because of personal relationships and not because of anything wrong with the wine or the wine company. But Charles had some other businesses that uh, didn't fare so well. And he ended up getting sued and ended up getting uh, indicted for something and ended up in prison that's kind of yeah. that's kind of the short version but it, it, anybody who wants to know more about it can google 
Charles Banks in relationship to the basketball player Tim Duncan. And, right. Uh, the whole the whole story comes comes out. You know, it was well well documented in the uh, in the press. So there's a question on the screen. What should we be drinking? We should be drinking. I think we should start with the Verdad Albarino, right? I mean, yeah. that seems like good. That's what I'm drinking anyway. This, this is so when I go home tonight, you know, Louisa will be very happy that I showed the label on. But well, let, Verdad is what a, we, there you go. Why don't you explain Verdad a little bit to me and everyone else? Because so my wife, Louisa, uh, is a winemaker as well, and she loves. Uh, Albarino and, and kind of all all Spanish varieties. She's not from Spain, but she just uh, she had worked at a retail shop in New York uh, back when she was a young woman. And in that retail shop, they happened to have like a dozen different Spanish Albarinos, and she became really intrigued with the variety. And when she moved to California, she was living in San Francisco, which is where we met, and she was kind of uh, astounded that there was no Albarino or not much being done with Albarino, if anything, in California. So I, I told her that I, I have a friend locally, Brian Babcock, who had just mm -hmm. brought in um, a suitcase clone of Albarino from Rio Spicious from the winery Morgadillo. And he had planted it at his vineyard in, in uh, the Santa Rita Hills. And so we, we went and visited Brian and Brian had made a couple demijohns of, of of Albarino and, and determined that his site was too cool for the variety. I think he probably gave up on it too early, but he is in a really cool site. And Albarino is a very high acid grape, so it needs a little bit more warmth maybe. But um, anyways, we got some budwood from Brian, uh, planted at first at a little vineyard in Los Olivos. And then when we planted uh, our Sawyer Lindquist vineyard in the Edna Valley, we planted some there as well. And that's where this comes from, is from the the Sawyer Lindquist Vineyard, which we also sold. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, can we talk about, can we talk about, well, let's first let's talk about the wine. You, I mean, I'm, I know you didn't make it, but you surely know some of the, yeah, yeah. So told I'm, you some of her secrets, I'm sure, of how she made this. Yeah, so Louise is the, the winemaker for this, and I'm the assistant winemaker, and then I make yeah. Lindquist wines, and she's the assistant winemaker. For so you wine. clean everything. <laughs> yeah, so we run run everything by each other, but, you know, it's, Obviously, you know, real a real fresh, crisp white wine. Yeah. I mean, you, you know where it comes from, from the northwest corner of Spain, where they get a lot of rain, and, and seafood is the uh, dominant cuisine of of that of Galicia, which is where Albarino is primarily grown in, in Spain. And, what is the aging vessel of this? Uh, in, in half in stainless steel and half in neutral barrels. Okay. And then we put it through Mallow, uh, which is uh, kind of unusual, but not really because Albarino is such a high acid variety that if you don't put it through Mallow, it tends to be a little bit too too crisp. No, it has a really nice weight to it, but still great acidity. I mean, you can feel that. There's a there's a delicate richness, if I can say that. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about that vineyard a little bit, because I don't know much about it. I knew you planted it, and I was always intrigued, and it was all biodynamic, which, of course, is something that I'm I'm into. And Yeah, yeah. So we, and it was in Edna Valley. Is it Edna Slide Edna Hill? Is that separate? Or Say that again? The Slide Hill vineyard is not same, the same vineyard. Same vineyard, yeah. So, so oh, it is the same vineyard. All right. Yeah, same vineyard. So uh, in 2002, Louisa and I bought an 80-acre uh, ranch parcel in, in the Edna Valley. And uh, we planted 40 acres of grapes there in 2005. Farmed it biodynamically from the beginning. Uh, we were very intrigued with the concept of biodynamic and mm -hmm. my friend Steve Beckman had already been farming biodynamically for, for a few years. So we got to see the results of, of kind of his experiment, you know, with, with mm -hmm. and, and um, we like we like the idea, and, and I happened to be uh, on a sales trip to London, England, of all places, and um, in 2005, right before we planted the vineyard. And the first day that I arrived, uh, and let me back up just one second. We, as we were getting ready to plant the vineyard, Louisa and I were still on the fence about whether to farm it organically or whether to farm it biodynamically. We were on the fence. Then I took the sales trip to uh, London and my agent picked me up at the hotel on the first day I was there. We were going to go out and call on accounts. And he said, Bob, I hope you don't mind, but 
uh, Dominique Lafon and Andre Ostertag are doing a seminar on biodynamics at um, mm. and would you like to go with me to see this? And I said, well, this was meant to be. So I went to the seminar, heard what they had to say. And uh, later that night, we all had dinner together. And I told them that I was planting this new vineyard and I was on the fence about organic or biodynamic. And they both looked at me like I was crazy, like you're planting a new vineyard and you just heard what we had to say and you're not convinced that you're going to farm it biodynamically so that's how it came about wow and and you you sold the vineyard now though you're still a, a fan of biodynamics very much so yeah it's a it's for me it's kind of the gold standard of organic farming um i mean there's a lot of it that's hard to understand and and i don't try to understand some of it i i just know that it works you know and i think as maybe well you know this i think as much as anything the importance of biodynamics is paying very close attention to the vineyard. You yeah. Know, you're, you're, you're kind of forced to pay close attention to the vineyard because you're not applying these chemicals, you know, that take care of. Totally. Care of for you. So, yeah. I mean, I think for me, it, it, my introduction to it and then following it, it made me think more about what I was doing and, and not just the vineyard, but the the land and the the entire picture. It made me think of the whole thing a little more holistically, I suppose. But yeah, I yeah paying attention to detail, but not just worrying about the grapes. Just everything involved in in a piece of property, and that's what it that's what it did to me. It just kind of opened my mind to try and be more diverse with what we do within the vineyard. Right. Yeah, no, it's, it's it's really it's, well, it's just a great method of farming. So I was going to ask the same question as Steve Hewitt just asked. So do you still buy fruit from your old vineyard? I do. So we sold it coming out of the recession, you know, the 2008 recession, we were, we were struggling. You know, we, we had expanded our winery uh, during that same period. Um, we were kind of optimistic about the future. <laughs> and, and when we bought the property in, in the Edna Valley, it's like coastal California real estate. What could go wrong? You know, that, that was kind right. of right. And, and we found out in, in 2007, 2008, you know, what could go wrong with, with real estate in general, you know, the, the housing bubble and the kind of recession and real estate crisis. So coming out of that, we, you know, just, we, we, we were managing, but, but we didn't, it was just us. We didn't have uh, deep pockets and we couldn't really survive uh, the, the results of that. So we decided to sell the vineyard with the, caveat that we would still get you know whatever grapes we wanted to from the vineyard and also with the other caveat that the new owner would continue to farm it biodynamically no oh, nice and who is the owner uh, his name is brooke williams and he okay. <clears throat> i knew him from zaka mesa winery he had been the president of zaka mesa for about 10 years and uh, so we knew each other you know professionally and he had uh, prior to buying uh, our vineyard, had bought a vineyard uh, in uh, Lompoc called Presidio, which he renamed Duverita. And anyway, okay. he, so he had bought Duverita. He then bought Sawyer Lindquist Vineyard. He renamed um, Presidio Vineyard Duverita, renamed Sawyer Lindquist Vineyard Slide Hill. And, um, and then we had the rights to continue using the name Sawyer Lindquist as long as we were continuing to, to buy the grapes from there. Uh, Louisa and I have the rights to that. And also Ethan, uh, for he, he'd been made, making some wines from that vineyard as well. Yeah, maybe I can get his part because he's now in Pennsylvania, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, I mean, I, I've enjoyed the wines from Eric Grave Vineyard. It must be a heartbreaker to lose something like that, no doubt. Right? Well, it, it was, but at the same time, Neil, it was a relief, you know, because it was, it was, right. it was very expensive. And, you know, I'm, Louisa and I are not farmers as much as we are winemakers. You know, we, we make wine and we go out and we promote the wine and sell the wine. We were learning farming kind of as we go, as we went. And we, you know, had a farming company and a biodynamic consultant, you know, during this whole time. And it was a lot of pressure, you know, to keep all the, all the balls in the air uh, with, with all those. So even though it was kind of like giving up my left arm when we sold the vineyard, yeah. um, 
the left arm grew back. <laughs> and, and, yeah. Uh, and, so and, good. And, and yeah, and and it was really kind of a relief. And 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 frankly, Brooke has done a great job of you know continuing the farming there. And uh, so you know, we we feel like the vineyard hasn't missed a beat qualitatively, which is good. That's really cool. And so at that point, you were making coupe then sawyer linguist when did what what is the chain of events with which brings us to the linguist label that i'm looking at here for the grenache right when coupe was sold i decided to start a new label uh which is the linguist label so that was just started okay. last year uh in the spring of last year and uh so the, this is first vintage that i'm looking at well no it, it, it i actually bought some of my own wine back <laughs> during you know bulk wine so so yeah, yeah. when when coupe was sold to this company called vintage wine estates i bought back a little bit of the wine that i had made for coupe um to to start this this new label so that's how that's how i got it started and then we we also uh, uh sourced uh, some bulk wine from a couple of friends of ours that we like uh there was a a vineyard in Los Alamos called Martian Vineyard that had decided mm -hmm. to stop making wine. Uh, also, a Demeter certified biodynamic vineyard. Uh, they had they they had planted this beautiful vineyard, built a winery, and decided that they were just going to continue. They weren't going to make wine anymore, but they were going to continue selling grapes, and they wanted to sell some of the the bulk wine that they had uh, in in barrel. So we bought a little bit of that to supplement the wine that we bought, you know, th from Coupe. And that's how we launched the launched the Linquis brand last year. I'm actually negotiating with Martian Ranch to buy a very small Fudra for Loma Drone as we speak, because they're selling a bunch of really cool tanks down there. They, 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 they have a lot of great equipment, that's for sure. Yeah, it's a bit pricey, but I'm trying. Or is it? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm excited, but I had Alberini in it, so maybe some of your stuff touched it. So, moving on, let's try the the Tablas Creek Marsan. And reality being here that, and you you remember perhaps, or you can make it up better than I can. When Tablas Creek first came to town, they came to you looking for a Marsan. There it is. There it is. And the original Tablas Creek plantings were in 1992. And I think they may have come from you. Is that right, or am I mistaken? Then. Uh, yeah, yeah. They they got the you know Bob Haas and and uh, Jean Pierre and Francois Perrin when they were looking to buy property here on the Central Coast. Uh, they contacted me. I'm not even sure how what there there was some connection. I'm not sure what it was, but they contacted me about uh, Santa Barbara. Well, I think it was probably just because I was making Rhone wines in Santa Barbara County, and there wasn't a lot being done with it at that time. Uh, so that's probably how we came together to begin with. And uh, I gave them kind of, I was kind of their tour guide around Santa Barbara County, uh, looking at different properties and, you know, showing them what we were doing and showing them some wines, et cetera. And, uh, and then when they settled on the property in Paso Robles, where you are now, um, they bought some budwood, some Marsan budwood from, right. yeah, and planted it at, at Tablas Creek because, as you know, Marsan is not one of the 13 Chateauneuf varieties. No, it is not. No, it is not. So can I ask you, honestly, um, how was that? How was that moment driving around with Bob Haas and the Perens? I mean, this is obviously before I'd even met them for it was, sure. It was, it was cool, you know, because they, they were so excited about their plans, you know, and, and what they were looking for. And, um, you know, they wanted to basically create something like Bocastel, but here on the central coast and uh and knowing you know they all knew that it was going to be different because it was going to be here on the central coast but they wanted to kind of create something that would be synergistic with what they were doing in france and uh and especially bob i think was um the most excited because he's an american and and you know really um and wanted to i don't know if he had moved to this area. In fact, I'm sure he hadn't moved to this area yet. No, he hadn't. No, for sure not. And now that I think back on it, he for sure hadn't. But I think he also wanted to, you know, 
live here uh, in the later part of his life. And, and uh, so that was, uh, yeah, it was, it was fun showing him around. And we had well, they almost, they almost bought the, they almost bought what is now Stoltman, right? I mean, they, they were, I don't know if they were in escrow, but they were certainly on the negotiation. And then the, they found the piece up here and they jumped on that instead for, right. I think for limestone reasons, probably I'm not sure, but uh, well, um, and that's right. You know, there there is limestone in that part. Well, actually, the- also probably yeah. mostly the reason was the yeah. ability to ripen more vedra was that was one, probably their that, that the was, pivotal that, thing. No, that was the pivotal thing was that they wanted a place that would be a little bit warmer for more bed. And, yeah, uh, and they felt like that Stoltman site might be a little too cool for it, and. Right or wrong, where, yeah, they, where they ended up worked out great, that's for sure. It, it seems to be rolling okay, yeah. And so I inherited that that Marsan, planted in 1992, and it uh, it was always a, a, a bit of a struggle for me because we always had the weird this weird note of, well, I don't know what the right term, kind of canned, corny, weird stuff, and we came to you and – asked you what you did and you gave us gave us some great advice on some juice finding that you had done and experiments you played and we started doing that well it's a long time ago but really changed our game and after that is when we started doing our first varietal marsans because we got rid of that little aroma that we didn't like on your advice and we we actually just followed that regime today with our first pasalan marsan that came in and one of the guys that has just started working for us, was asking me why, and I just said, well, because Bob Lindquist told me to. <laughs> <laughs> There's a funny little story attached to that, Neil. The, you know, the first year I made Marsan was 1987, and it turned out right. beautiful. Yeah, and I just kind of... I was 10 then, you know. I kind of felt like it, like I was just lucky to have made, uh, made this wine so nicely from this, you know, young crop. It, it, it was a vineyard that we had grafted over in Los Olivos. Uh, I'd gotten the budwood from Randall, who had apparently stolen the uh, budwood from UC Davis. And, <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um, and then in 1988, I made the wine again, and the wine smelled like canned corn. And it's like, oh, this is weird. And shortly after the 88 harvest, I went on a boys' trip with three friends of mine, with Jim Clendenin, Frank Ostini, and Doug Marjoram. The four of us went to um, is it true? Visit, visit different wine areas and kind of, you know, learn more about the business. And uh, um, when we got to the Rhone, we visited uh, Jean Louis Chave, and Gerard, yeah. Gerard Chave was the winemaker in charge. You know, the, the current Jean Louis's father, who and Gerard is actually still alive and influencing Jean Louis uh, still. Mm-hmm. But John, uh, Gerard was firmly in charge at that point at at, uh, at Shav, and I told him about my issue with Marsan and canned corn, and he said, "Well, you must separate the the, the clear juice from the leaves before you ferment." Said, oh, he said, "You know that, right?" And I said, "No, I didn't know that." <laughs> so, Did not know that. So that's so that's where that came from, and, and I've been doing that ever since. Settling and it works. Juice, and it works. Yeah. Shav is funny. Everyone has their their winery game-changing moment in Shav Sarai is most definitely mine with John Munch. We did a, it was actually strangely, you, you mentioned Doug Marsham. It was at the wine cast. We did a vertical tasting of Shav Syrah Hermitage. And I, I forget what vintage it was. It was, I think it was an early nineties vintage probably, but kind of blew my mind and that a wine could taste like that. You know, it was a game changer for me. That was Shav, and it took me a lot of years. But eventually, when I was working with with Bokestel and Francois took me up there, and uh, Jean Louis Shav and Francois and I tasted through the cellar. It was kind of a, a starstruck moment for me, if you will. Well, so we have yeah, it's fun to taste there because they have all those different components from Hermitage that you can taste separately before they blend them all together. Yeah. It's it's my I'd love to go back and now I I have a better knowledge and to go back and spend more time there. I see Ian just threw up on the screen your 
coupe that we tasted, uh, what is that, an 89 that we tasted at our 30th anniversary that we did with you and me and Jason and Justin Smith, yeah. 89 being the year that Tablas purchased the property, the, the Haas and Pren family anyway. There we are. Yeah, cool. You're wearing Dodger blue again, strange. <laughs> that was also the year that uh, Jim Clendenin and I built the winery here at Biendecito Vineyard where we make- where Was we it? Was that 89? 89 also yeah there it is 30 year 30 year yeah. so i actually opened we have as you do i believe we do our harvest lunches every day with the with the team at um Tablas, and we opened a, a bottle and now i'm it was either a 94 or 96 Tablas. it wasn't Tablas creek then it was adelaide hills or Tablas hills or whatever it was called in those days that we had made and it was a blend, but it was mostly Marsan in those days from the stuff that you had supplied. And I didn't think it would be really worth anything this at this point, but it was really good. And everyone at the table was kind of blown away. I mean, at very best, it was like four-year-old grapevines, you know. It's, and I remember Bob was so excited back then, like what could be. And and it's pretty cool now to, to sit here with what have we got, the 18, you know, all these years later, tasting from that same block. And it's still it's still working, and we've now moved to making it in Fudra mostly. We do the Marsan in Fudra now, and following your advice with the racking, et cetera. But Fudra fermented, Fudra aged, and loving it. Yeah, that would work well. I I just saw a question from Steve Hewitt come up on the screen. Will I sell him a couple bottles of '87 Marsan? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> in, fact, in fact, in fact, I don't have any bottles of '87 Marsan. It, it seems. What's like the oldest coupe Marsan that you do have in your cellar? '88, and, and and I think that there is a bottle or two somewhere. I've actually been organizing my my personal cellar lately, and I haven't come across it yet. But I keep hoping as I open up new boxes that no, it's in there. And is there is there a uh, Marsan, the Bob Linkers have made and tasted that you think has gone too long or do they continue yeah. to age well? It, it depends on the vintage. Uh, and and a, a lot depends on how much um, SO2 we end up putting up in the wine, you know, because we sell Marsan as a young drinking white wine. Mm -hmm. So we, we, I've always been very careful about the amount of SO2 that I put in the wine. But I find that if I, if I get the, the SO2 level kind of just just right, you know, just high enough, but without being too high, it really helps uh, the wines age well. Marsan is a variety, ages well. But right. the, the best the best vintages, there's for whatever reason, there have been some vintages that have aged better than others and held their youthfulness better than others. And uh, the only thing that can contribute it to besides the, the, the vintage is the amount of SO2 that, yeah. Huh. So just a, a little more carries it a little longer. That's right. That's kind of interesting when you think of when it starts getting old. I would have thought that had diminished in its uh, efficacy, yeah. but hey. Well, and 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 it, and it does. But I think it, it's getting it to that point where it can then kind of age gracefully beyond. Right. You know, because there have been a couple of vintages that have uh, that I've made. That have kind of reached their peak after about 10 years and and yet there's other vintages like the 89 that if i still had a a good sound bottle of that would still be good so um it, it is a variety that ages remarkably well and um i've kind of made the wines the same way every vintage and tried to you know nail the the, the balance and the and the sulfur addition but you know, it's, 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 it's not always an exact art. So, so when you say you make them the same way, would that be neutral French wood, I would assume? Fermenting it in neutral French barrels, exactly. Right. And tell us, please, that you're continuing to make Marsan under the Linquist label. I, I am. In fact, we planted Marsan at the Sawyer Linquist vineyard. Okay. And, and, that's, and that's now our, our source of Marsan. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, I figured you would have. Yeah, we yeah, and and we've also made a dessert wine from that same vineyard block, you know, in kind of the Vendapai style, 
All right. Yeah. I bet that's cool. That kind of seems to lend itself. Marsan will lend itself well to that. We do a Roussan at Tablas, but I, I think Marsan was more traditional in the Northern Rhone for a Van de Pie style wine, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, no, it makes delicious wine. Nobody cares about it or buys it, but we <laughs> we like to give it away at the end of winemaker dinners. <laughs> yeah, ditto for all the sweet wines that we make. And every time I taste them, I think I should open these more, and then I never do. Yeah. <laughs> So let's move along then. Let's let's jump into the new era, the Linquist Grenache 2018 Demeter. I don't know if we can get that on there, I'm not very good with this thing, but there it is. There's the Demeter certification of. And it should be the 2019. Should be the 2019. 19, sorry, 19. Yeah. Which we actually just bottled, and, and I would rather have had the 18 because. The 19 is, is a little too young, but we have sold the last of it to our distributor in California. So well, that's that, a good thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, rather have sold it than send it to me, I imagine. <laughs> well, they, and they, they have some in their stocks, but we don't have any left of the 18 in our stocks. So I thought, well, we had just bought this, and, and frankly, it's showing pretty well. So I thought, well, super let's pretty. You want, to, you want to talk us through it a little bit? So, sorry, Linquist Vineyard. Yeah. So full Demeter stamp, so all certified biodynamic farming. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's it's actually Tablas clone of Grenache. What you guys call Tablas A. A, yeah, yeah. Uh, at Sawyer Linquist, we have Tablas A and then also uh, uh, C and D. And where, where we get from is kind of the original planting that we planted there, which is the Tablas A clone. <laughs> That's what we're here along with 20% Syrah. Do you find that, uh, I mean, yeah, pretty much what we're working with, we have a little B also, but A, C, and D are the bigger components. I find that A generally has more structure than C and D. C and D are a little bit prettier and softer in our site, at least. A more perfumed, I think, yeah. But the A, I love the A, and, um, you know, I think one – you know, thing very significant about this Neil is that it's grown in a in a cooler climate zone than you would typically find Grenache. Uh, Grenache, you know, is normally grown in in you know you think of Chateauneuf du Pape or Priorat or Barassa or yeah. Passerelle. Yeah, uh, you don't really think of Grenache being grown side by side with Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. No, uh, for sure. But I've been sort of on a a bit of a Grenache. Of session lately of just trying to figure out what it is to me you know what is my favorite part of it you know i i did one of these evening things with um both angela from tribute to grace and then also jessica from story of soil and they're doing really cool stuff with grenache and there's a lot of really interesting styles of grenache out there and i honestly think the pretty lighter style i mean i prefer it i i love the the delicacy that it brings the perfume and that's kind of where i'm finding because it's such a i mean you can take it to so many different areas you know we got people up here making it the you know, 16 percent massive red wine you know not like zinfandel but in that world of weight right and i i don't love that as much as i like the delicate pretty stuff that i'm tasting and i think there's there's people now really doing good stuff with that. Molly Lomborg up here is doing a carbonic one that is really pretty and exciting to me. So I agree with you. I think it should do well in a cooler climate and make a really pretty wine. I mean, exactly. it can do so many different things. It's kind of figuring out what you want to do with it. Exactly. And, and, and as you know, we have some of our best weather in September and October here on the Central Coast. Yeah. Even though we have this long, cool summer that are kind of ideal for – early ripening varieties like Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, we then have these great, you know, weather months of September and October, uh, where later ripening varieties like Roussan, like Grenache, like Syrah, you know, can hang out there for a long time and develop a lot of flavor without developing too much sugar. So it, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a very unique and special area for, for the variety. That's just Bob, I loved your Dodger, sir. There was a Dodger, sir. Uh, where did you source those grapes from? There you go. You better answer that because it's a Dodger question. Yeah, that was actually a, a, a similar blend to the, the, the wine that we make 
made for Coupe called Central Coast Syrah. It was a blend of several different vineyards. I, I tweaked the blend slightly to make it a little bit different. But uh, in um, 2014, we, we signed a deal with this company called Wine, Wines by Design that has rights with Major League Baseball to make co-branded uh, wines with Major League Baseball teams. And nobody was making a Dodger wine. So I made a, a Syrah and a Chardonnay for a couple of years, uh, co-branded Coupe and, and Dodger. So, yeah. Who else would they have chosen, really, to be with Dodger? That's right. I've, I'm not really a baseball fan, but I've become a fan of the Dodger Giants rivalry because I have friends in both camps. And that's right. You know, I'm a, from a town with two soccer teams that hate each other. So it's great to be able to watch other people argue about <laughs> the minutia of baseball. <laughs> it is a great rivalry. And you, you may not know this, Neil, because you're, you're not from here, but that rivalry goes back to New York. Really? You know, I know that. Played for, for a, a very long time in Brooklyn, and the Giants played in New York. And so their rivalry in the National League goes back to those those days in the late 1800s up until 1958 when both the Giants and the Dodgers moved west. Wow. Wow. The, you'd have to speak to Jason about this, but I believe that his father was actually offered a position pitching for the New York Yankees, I think it was, and turned it down because he realized that he was not really big enough or something, he told me. he, I think he said to me, I realized that the – the one-legged left arm pitcher would have done better than me, really. <laughs> yeah, pretty cool story. I think this is really, really pretty. Do you want to talk about production? You know what? You, what you put it in? What you? Yeah, what so people we, yeah, so like we, to hear? We we kind of make it the old-fashioned way. We ferment it in small open-top fermenters. Uh, with this vintage, we used about a third whole clusters, which I like with with Grenache, and I also like with Syrah. Uh, this has 20% Syrah in the blend. The two varieties are made separately. And then later on, I blend, you know, and decide how much Syrah to put in with the Grenache. I, I, I like one of the things about cool climate Grenache is it never develops much color. And that doesn't right. really bother me, but it bothers some people out in the marketplace. So having a little bit more color in the wine kind of helps sell the wine and it also i think gives the wine a little bit more complexity and richness so uh, you think you're bringing straw mostly for color uh, and a little bit of structure a little bit of structure a little bit of spice you know a little bit of complexity and uh, but mainly for the color it's a shame that people are obsessed with color i mean we have a lot of i i play the same game but so many beautiful grenaches that are pale if if you if people couldn't see it, if you gave it to them in a black glass, they would not be affected, you know, because they wouldn't see that color. But it kind of bums me out sometimes. But color is important. It looks nice in the glass, and that's an important factor for sure. And we we've we've all done a bit of that. So let's move on to the Tablas Creek, which is a lot of the same clone for sure. And this is 2018. Yeah, it is. I was thinking about that, obviously. And a little, and clearly paler in color. Yeah, I mean this this is classic Grenache color. You know, it's not not. It, it looks beautiful. And I've honestly, if if I tell the truth, I struggled for years at Talbot's Creek. I mean. We struggled with Grenache forever. I mean, until 2006, we just never made one that we were happy with. And I I still struggled for the longest time with the color. It's like, well, I can't, you know, I love it, but it's just not deep enough. People aren't gonna dig it. And I think we've gone to a point now where we can get away with it not being super dark. And I mean, I, I think I agree with that. There's a moment to put a bit of Syrah on it, but we get away with lighter than we used to. And I think that's part of my Grenache journey is, you know what? It's pretty good when it's pale and it is as, as it is. I mean, it just doesn't go dark. I mean, there's nothing I can do about that. Well, no, and, and, and actually the, you know, many people would consider one of the standards for, or the benchmarks for Grenache to be Chateau Reyes. And Reyes is not a dark wine. 
It's it's no. reportedly 100% Grenache, and it's not a dark wine. It's yeah. in fact very similar to this in color. I've had the pleasure of going to Reyes once, and I'm not sure pleasure is the right word, but it took me forever to get in there. I went with, you know, you've met Claude from Bokestel, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. He's now retired, but he was there, winemaker, vineyard guy for many years. And it took me almost the entire time I was there to get in there, and we showed up, and they they handed me a jelly jar, <laughs> and they handed, they handed Claude a... Yeah, and they had a clawed a wine glass with a broken stem and said it was a the enologist glass. <laughs> it was so classic. Yeah, and I mean in barrel the the wines are quite awkward and sweet and weird, and then you taste the bottles out right? in the real world. I it's so expensive, I don't get to enjoy it very often, but it, it is something quite special. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of a, in a it's a different expression of of Chateau Neuf de Pop from the traditional expressions of Chateau Neuf de Pop. And, and I can only contribute that to, to their site and also the fact that they reportedly only use Grenache in the, in the, in the wine. Reportedly, I like, I like that caveat. Yeah, yeah. yeah they're, 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 I've, I've, I've heard, I, I won't name names, but I've heard from somebody very well connected in, in Chateau Neuf de Pop that they think that there's something else besides just Grenache that goes in. But, Maybe not even a Rome varietal, right? <laughs> I've heard know. the same rumor. <laughs> we'll have to talk about that off air because I've heard the same rumor. I'm curious if it's the same grape. I mean, and of course, I mean, for me, perhaps the benchmark of all Grenache is, is the Gigondas, which I love. I check the same calm, et cetera. Bob, did one of your kids end up choosing a college in the Boston area? Uh, no, that's funny because Steve, I, I, I think I did talk to Steve about that, but uh, no, he ended up going to UC Santa Barbara. So where, where's the future of Linquist? I mean, you're going to continue buying from Slide Hill, of course. And yeah, so we're, we're, are you are you planting more vineyard or? No, no we're we're just buying grapes now. Uh, so we'll continue to buy grapes from, from you know, Sawyer Lindquist slash Slide Hill uh, from Biennacito, where the winery is located. I make Chardonnay and Syrah from Biennacito, and then next year, Roussan. And uh, and then we buy grapes also now from Martian Ranch a little bit. Okay. We also buy from a, a, a vineyard called Ampelos, uh, which is another Demeter certified. Demeter. They've been offering us some fruit, too. Exactly. Is that a good thing? Is nice vineyard Ampelos? Yeah, it's beautiful. And then, and then I'm making a Chardonnay also from this new vineyard in the Santa Rita Hills that's owned also by Brooke Williams, the same guy that owns Slide right. Hill and is a new vineyard called Christian Wise. Um, and he's planted, you know, Grenache and Syrah and Pinot Noir and Chardonnay there. And I'm getting a little bit of Chardonnay from that vineyard. 2019 will be the first. Uh, release of that there's a lot of really cool stuff going on down there for sure you know I, my my children are becoming boys my sons are becoming more and more involved and i've been with my loma drone project i've been rigidly west paso because that's my my home and zone but they're constantly chomping at the bit to get down to santa barbara and play with They've asked me a thousand times to call you about Slide Hill and Ampelos are sending us offers. And, and I think we will at some point go down there and make some fun stuff from some biodynamic stuff down there. I think that would be cool. I, I, I agree. Yeah, there's more and more being done with biodynamics in, you know, Santa Barbara County and Southern San Luis Obispo County. And, and I'm sure there's more being done with it up in up in your area as well. I think it seems like there is definitely up here more and more. I mean, organics more than ever. You know, when we first started with organic at Tablas, we were freaks of nature almost. But now it's almost going beyond that. And there's more and more biodynamics. But I see it a lot down there. There seems to be a lot of motivation in Santa Barbara for whatever reason to go that way. I saw an, a question from Charlie earlier and said, what's the difference between Spanish Grenache and Grenache? The way it's made, I don't really have an answer for that. What would be your answer to what is the difference between the Granacha and the Grenache? Mainly, mainly where it's grown. You know, probably the most famous area for Garnacha in in Spain would be either Monsant or uh, Priorat, 
prayer up. It's it, yeah, it's it, you know the soils are different and it's warmer in that part of Spain, so the wines tend to be a little bit more. They they tend to be a little bit bigger and dense and dark and and uh, a little more syrupy in in style. And I'm generalizing because there's exceptions to that, but of course that, that's it's it's the, it's the same grape variety, but as with any grape variety, there's different clones or selections or mutations of, of, of the grape. And I think, you know, in, in Spain, they also have some different selections of Garnacha that, you know, show differently in different areas as well. Yeah, I've been to Peru. It was cool. Yeah. I'd like to investigate Spain more, but we did a trip to Prior out and it was really interesting. We tasted some great wines and some of them were huge, Yeah, but some of them weren't, some of them were made, in a more elegant style, and I I think that's cool. It's yeah. really fun to see. What is the other area? Penendez was the other place we went, which was doing some interesting stuff too. That's right. Frank Ness is telling me to listen to my children and come and buy more fruit from Santa Barbara. I'm not sure I can tell them that. But <laughs> well, Bob, you got anything to add to this thing? What what can you tell people about where to follow you to and what you're doing and well, we, we self warning. We make the wines at, at, at Biennacito Vineyard, the same place where I made the Coupe wines prior to that. Uh, the winery itself is not open for visitors, but we have a tasting room in Arroyo Grande, in what's called the Village of Arroyo Grande, uh, where we sell the Lindquist and the Verdad wines. And, uh, and of course, we have a website. You know, just go to verdad.com or lindquistwines.com. And, um, and then we, you know, distribute the wines. We, 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 we believe in... Uh, you know, we still believe in the old three-tier system and selling wine to distributors who would then go out and call on the restaurants and the, the retail stores. Uh, so our wines, even though we don't make nearly the quantities that we used to make under the QP label, we are just... What are you making? What are you making under the Lindquist label? What quantity are you making under Lindquist? Between Lindquist and Verdot, it's about 5,000 cases total. Oh, wow. That's okay. So let's... Let's give some people some perspective. What were you making at your highest moment of volume with Coupe? About, about 40,000 cases. Wow. And, and, so you're and doing that, Yeah, and of that 40,000 cases, Neil, about 20,000 cases was the wine that we just simply called Central Coast Syrah, which is the mm -hmm. wine that we made the most of and sold the most of kind of nationwide and even internationally. Boy, 40,000 cases is, is a, a large amount of wine. You spent a lot of time on the road. You must be a bit relieved to be only having to sell 5,000. It, it, it does make it easier, although these days with what we're going through with COVID-19, you know, and restaurants being closed, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, the marketplace is a little bit different. You know, the, the, the distributors have had to furlough or lay off some of their salespeople. It's been, oh, it's, been, yeah. it's been a tough period. It's been a tough six months for, for the wine business. But, but the bright spot there is that it's been a good six months for wine retailers because people were still buying and drinking wine. And so retailers actually got kind of a nice bump in, in their sales. And, and, and we actually got a bump in a direct is your, to consumer sales during it, that period. But, but, of course, we lost the sales that we normally would have had in restaurants. So is your tasting room in the Rogue Grande, is that pretty well set up for the current COVID? We have to, because of the current, uh, you know, laws or, or regulations surrounding COVID, we can only taste outside. But uh, we're in a, a nice weather area. We have a nice outdoor patio. And Perfect. So we taste the wines outdoors and, and then... You can buy. You can come inside the tasting room to buy the wines, you know, with the mask on. And but uh, um, but you have to taste. Outside. Yeah, I mean, Tablas, Tablas is operating the same. I mean, wear your mask on the way in, put down a table outside, and right. it's actually a pretty. It's a great experience. We're doing doing well with it, and people are enjoying it because they're getting really close attention at table side it's kind of i think it'll change a lot of things for all of us and is doing stuff like this you know this is the longest conversation i've ever had with bob linkers one-on-one -on -one, you know <laughs> which is kind of nice you know so i think a lot of things will change including the tasting room experience yeah yeah, yeah. 
They, 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 might even right, adopt right, right. The, they might even adopt some of the new baseball rules that they've put into place this year uh, going going forward. So we'll, we'll see about that. I won't get into that. I just thought I'd I know nothing that. about that. Part. <laughs> well, you've been having that conversation with your wife, and I look forward to seeing you soon. And thank you so much for doing this. You're, you're, a, you're a wonderful man. Thank you, Neil. I appreciate it.